Hey guys, and welcome to our Q&A. My husband stole my standing desk <laughs> since he's working from home, so I am sitting here on a chair, which is fun. All right, so let's go ahead and dive in and get started with questions. We have some good ones for this round. Question number one is thoracic outlet syndrome stretches or exercises. Okay, so thoracic outlet syndrome is interesting. It's really, I think from a physical therapy standpoint, it's really fun to treat. Uh, it has a lot to do with multiple systems in your body. One of those being breathing. How are you breathing? And the reason why we always start with breathing is because if I breathe into my neck and shoulders, it primarily works my scalenes. What do our scalenes do? Our scalenes press on our brachial plexus, causing thoracic outlet syndrome. You got it. So for every shallow breath you take, every breath where it goes a little bit more into your upper shoulders than your backsides and belly, like a good 360 breath, the more you're gonna increase your thoracic outlet syndrome. And so I typically see thoracic outlet syndrome in people who have a tendency to over brace. So they tend to hold too much tension in their abs. So when they're not thinking about it, that forces them into a shallow breathing. So maybe they have great deep breathing when they're thinking about it, but when they're not thinking about it, maybe holding too much tension in their belly, it forces their breath up. And so one of the things that you can work on is kind of letting your abs go a little bit to let that breath go into your sides and back. That can be really helpful. And working on just fixing that deep breathing pattern where you breathe down and every breath is a deep breath so that you're not irritating the scalings. All right, as far as strength goes, you're gonna wanna take the pressure off the top. So think about it as nerve compression going on here. And so what do we need to do to get the compression off of this area of our nervous system? Well, you need to work on getting this through, okay? You need to work on getting lots and lots and lots of serratus. So serratus helps to pull the bottom of your scapula through. So when I see somebody do serratus circles or serratus activation, uh, I wanna see lots of armpit, I wanna see lots of scapula coming through from the bottom. I don't wanna see lat engagement, um, but oftentimes when they try to do serratus work, they look like this, and you can't see any of their armpit, shoulders tip forward, lots of anterior delt back in here, lots of compression on uh, those nerves again. The other thing we wanna see, other than lots of serratus, is we wanna get lots of lower traps. So what ends up happening is they usually end up becoming more of a rhomboid dominant person, uh, so your rhomboids are the muscles that attach to your scapula, but they sit more up in here, and we want to get more down in here, okay, for working back muscles. So oftentimes, there's good intention with the exercise programming, where you're doing lots of rows, scapular retraction stuff, maybe wise, whatever, um, like face down, scapula squeezes. But in doing them, you're preferentially using rhomboids over middle and lower traps, and so those um, rhomboids have a little bit of kind of upward tipping of that scapula um, for downward rotation, which then brings it kind of more forward. So we wanna think about everything that opens up, which is gonna be more lower traps. So making sure that you get the right back muscles when you're doing back work and you're not just kind of reinforcing that pattern. All right, and then you wanna look at deep cervical flexors, what's happening in your core, where your tongue positions in your mouth. So if you tend to press your tongue forward in your teeth, that's gonna cause your head to go forward, which is then gonna cause stress and compression in this area. So even what you're doing with your mouth, your teeth, your tongue during the day uh, can have an effect on thoracic outlet syndrome. Crazy, right? All right, and then you can look all the way down through your pelvis and your feet and posture because it all kind of plays a role with the setup and what's going on here and how pressure is relieved from this area. Okay, so hopefully that will give you some ideas to go with thoracic outlet syndrome. Question number two, after a C-section, can you eventually do high impact exercises? I'm planning my second C-section in two years and I've had people say once you've had one, you're at a greater risk of prolapsed organs. I feel like fear of hurting myself has kept me from doing things I enjoy doing um, and make me feel strong. Oh, that's so sad. I hate it when fear gets in the way of anything. We don't need to be afraid. We don't need to be afraid of movement. We just need a good plan. So I love it that you're, answer, that you're asking this question. I love it that you are wanting to get back into impact exercise, but that you're being cautious with yourself. I think that is um, great. So if you'll go back and check out my Q&A number two, where I go through getting back into running. Um, it's, a, it's a getting back into running with prolapse, so that's literally like a worst case scenario, right? So you're here in this boat wanting to prevent it, which is amazing. I love that, that you're in this place. So let's just go ahead and give you advice of worst case scenario, and then you can use that to work backwards 
uh, and then get what you need. So all the same steps apply uh, for impact ready for anyone postpartum. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, uh, two more things. One, vaginal deliveries increase prolapse risk more than a C-section. That's research. So I think you can obviously cause prolapse, um, not even having a baby. <laughs> Just chronic cough is a risk for prolapse. Uh, bearing down when you poop is a risk for prolapse. So you don't even have to have a baby to <laughs> increase that risk of prolapse. Um, but vaginal delivery definitely increases a lot more than C-section. So in that rate, you're a little bit on the safer side. Where you really need to have that consideration is scar massage. Um, so your C-section scar, C-section scar recovery, because our lower abs is, are linked to our pelvic floor for getting a great contraction, uh, keeping our pelvic floor safe. And so anytime you enter the abdominal wall, you can um, kind of disrupt the muscular firing. And so I see a lot of people, the C-section just have a little bit harder time getting their abs back on board uh, than people with vaginal delivery because, hey, you've invaded the abdominal area. Whenever we invade an area, our body's like, ah, shut down, shut down. Uh, but the same thing can happen even with laparoscopic surgery. So you just need some nice scar massage, some muscular re-education, uh, a good plan, and then, um, you're gonna be good to go. So awesome question. All right, question number three, is it reasonable to expect a functional core, i.e. no doming or sinking during intense things like kipping pull-ups, able to have a firm springy space even, or, even over an umbilical hernia um, to ever not look like I just ate a huge meal? Basically, will my abdominal wall ever be able to hold my breakfast in and beyond? Uh, yes, basically it's an aesthetics question. Okay, so I love that you just ask an aesthetics question because I see no, nothing wrong with wanting to look at aesthetics and I think body shaming can go <laughs> in all directions these days. So it can make women feel bad about just simply wanting to change the way they look, uh, which is horrible. Anyway, I think that um, we don't need to put women down for anything, no matter how you want or don't want to look, um, no matter what genetics you're bringing to the table. Um, anyway, so I don't think you should feel bad about asking that question. We feel bad about entirely too much as women. I know I have a lot of guilt. It's like, am I being a good enough parent? Am I being good enough at work? Like, how can I give all these parts of myself uh, and not feel guilty about not giving enough? And so anyway, okay, so far it's done. I think that um, we need to not feel bad, especially don't feel bad about asking a simple question. All right, so my answer is yes and no. <laughs> Let's move back on. My answer is yes and no. Uh, fascia takes a long time to turn over. Uh, are you always going to have some give pre-kid? Yeah, probably. You're always gonna have a little bit more give pre-kid than you did post-kid. We all do, <laughs> okay? Um, once something has been stretched out, it's, you know, it's stretched out, but that doesn't mean that you can't get back a lot more than you think you can. Um, so I think that there is, some leeway in that system, but there is always going to be a little bit more. I mean, you ask anybody who's gotten pregnant again and they're like, wow, I just instantly was bigger because uh, that pathway has been paid before and breakfast can be, you know, a small baby. All right. Um, so let's see. Can you eventually master a kipping pull up without doming? Possibly. I think so. Um, I don't know what it's going to take because I haven't seen you yet. Uh, so is it going to take a ton of work? Probably. Um, I generally find uh, that someone with doming during intense upper body moves needs to look at a few things. And I wrote down a list here just to make sure my thoughts were on point. All right. So how your upper body is connecting. All right. So are you moving from your paraspinals or are you moving more from your lower and middle traps? Do you have an amazing serratus? Um, are you externally dominant or internally dominant? How's your TA strength compared to your rectus strength compared to your oblique strength? All right, so it's not necessarily uh, that things are weak, it's that it can be an imbalance even on the strong side. Uh, so that can be, you know, kind of tricky for someone who thinks they're strong. Um, are you rotator cuff dominant? So um, I often see huge like Perry's major popping out uh, when somebody is loading their upper body, when I should be seeing lats, I should be seeing middle and lower traps. I'm like, what is this rotator cuff doing, doing all the work? And that is oftentimes the side um, where I will see um, 
a little bit more damning. Like if we're loading single arm, I like to load single arm a lot to be able to test the system, to see where the missing link is, to see where maybe the twist is happening in the system, the imbalance is happening in the system. Um, so I'll have people do like a single arm lat load so I can see what's causing uh, the doming in pull-ups. And if we can identify the side where that's going wrong or the side where the weakness, then we can fix that. Um, so I will often see doming happen when they load one arm, but no doming when they load the other arm and then looking at the difference. And that difference is also more, often more on the orthopedic side and has nothing to do with like the actual linea alba itself and um, the core rehab, but more to do with how your scapula is integrating with your core system. Uh, so just something to keep in mind. It can get a little bit complicated on the orthopedics of it. Um, so how are you connecting to your lower body? So if it's not an upper body problem, um, how are you connecting to your lower body? And I know this sounds like a weird thing to bring out where you're like, why am I, would I be thinking about my legs uh, when it's happening in my midline and this is an upper body exercise with kipping? So I actually had someone who had doming with leg lifts that we were able to fix by looking at how her, she lifted her legs and what was firing in her pelvis. So one adductor was a little bit weaker than the other. And so when she'd lift, she'd kind of shift her legs off the side. And you can absolutely do that with a kipping pull up because it's a kip which involves your lower body. And so when we fix that kind of twist caused from a muscular imbalance, um, she didn't get any dummy, uh, which was really cool. So you could see the way she lifted her legs. I actually broke it down in a case study with video and freeze frames and writing on it. Um, in education and the same thing about like the individual lat holds that's in the, um, in the program and the PCS course. Uh, because I think that we need to look way away from the midline. Uh, we need to look way away from adassis when we are trying to address something that involves total body loading. And when you start getting into harder stuff, you start getting into kipping pull-ups, you start getting into leg lifts or even just, you know, isolated pull-ups and you're starting to know a pressure, notice a pressure management issue. Um, that's important. I would also, if you feel like you're very rectus dominant, you feel like you immediately balloon out after breakfast, I'm also going to wonder how tight your TAs are. Um, so it might be that you don't have enough ability to eccentrically load. They might be sitting in a shortened, tightened position. Uh, and that can cause a lot of problems with distension, belly distension in the front as well. Okay, so hopefully that advice helped and gave you some ideas to help um, spur your recovery. Question number four. I'd love to know what your take on pregnancy support gear like belly bands is when and if you would recommend something like that. Okay, absolutely. I think that belly bands can be great uh, while you are pregnant. Um, I do, however, want you to work on continuing to maintain muscle and strength throughout pregnancy in your abdominal wall. I want you to be able to contract your abs and lift that baby belly. Okay, so I don't want you to just rely on the band, uh, but a band can be a great form of support during pregnancy. All right, so. The other thing, the other part of this, when I don't like belly bands, is postpartum. Uh, newly postpartum can be fine, uh, especially if you give yourself a little bit of loose support. Uh, we don't wanna have over compression. Um, over compression, especially in the middle, can cause a lot of pressure down on the pelvic floor. Uh, and then especially if you keep that on for longer periods of time, our pelvic floor is just a little bit vulnerable, postpartum healing. And uh, so we wanna make sure that that doesn't happen. All right, so just be mindful of the postpartum period, um, wearing some sort of compression, especially if it's low to high, like compression shorts can be really good, as long as it's not too tight. You wanna use loose compression, not tight compression, um, and then I wouldn't put a band around your waist and cinch it in, because uh, that's gonna put a lot of pressure down on your pelvic floor. All right, question number five. Uh, Sarah, I have extremely tight hamstrings, inner thigh muscles, which makes some exercises difficult. What exercises, exercises can I do to help loosen them up? Sitting ending style feels impossible. Thanks. Okay, so sitting, not being able to sit ending style tells me your hip is not moving in the socket. Okay, so when we think about bringing our leg out, the, the socket, the uh, joint, the ball, ball and socket needs to roll and glide. All right, and so being able to sit ending style tells me, not be able to sit ending style, tells me your muscles are guarding from allowing that joint to move. Now, muscles often guard uh, because they are overworked. Uh, because maybe the joint is being held in a position that it doesn't exactly feel comfortable. So I notice a lot of people with tightness in these areas, their hiplets, hip, their hiplets, <laughs> that, sorry, 
right, it is early in the morning, their hip likes to sit really far forward in the socket. Uh, and so this can cause um, more guarding around the joint. So always make sure your hip mechanics are great. A couple things that I like to check is glutes fire before hamstrings. Uh, so that test can be really good. Uh, is your adductor taking over because your glute medius is weak? So they both kind of come in from each side and help stabilize your pelvis. Um, is your pelvis forward in an anterior tilt? Do you clench and tuck under? So kind of where is your body trying to hold your pelvis? Uh, basically figure out what's pulling uh, and not sharing the load, so to speak, um, with your muscular system. All right, so there's a free Happy Hip series, so be sure to check that out because I think it's gonna spur a lot of ideas for you, and I think you're gonna love it because I actually talk about being able to cross your leg instead of the internal mass. So definitely check that out and see if it doesn't give you more ideas. Question number six, adrenal fatigue and urinary um, urgency. Okay, so I am not qualified to talk about adrenal fatigue. I do not have a degree in naturopathic medicine or um, medicine in general um, that talks about hormones, but <laughs> there you go, there was the qualification. But uh, in my experience, um, and I can talk about urgency, <laughs> but in my experience, urgency is linked more to our emotional state um, and training of our bladder um, than it is necessarily something in the physical. Of course, pelvic floor tightness. Uh, can cause that sense of urgency and that is physical. But if you've ruled out pelvic floor tightness, which then we come around to what's causing the pelvic floor tightness as well. Um, but if we come around to how the bladder is trained, the bladder is very, very, very easily trainable. Um, and so it only takes a few days. So basically like three days, you can train your bladder into more of a sense of urgency or less of a sense of urgency. Uh, so keeping a diary for that is a great idea. Um, but I love using meditation to help calm that system. I also love using distraction, especially for the bladder. Uh, let's distract it and wait a little bit, which is why um, keeping a journal is good. Uh, so then that brings me around to what's causing adrenal fatigue. All right, so usually adrenal fatigue is caused by the fact that your adrenals are literally worn out from producing too much stress hormones. So that tells me that you're probably under a bit of stress. And so I would say that's probably playing realm robin into your urgency issues uh, as well. So it's all kind of uh, feeding into that system. So I know for me, um, and I'm just talking about myself because I am not qualified to give advice on stress. Um, that is a whole nother degree. <laughs> um, but I know for me, usually in my life, I end up with two choices. I can either become more resilient, which has been a hard pill to swallow, uh, and accept the stress that is in my life and find a way to deal with it. Um, or I can decrease the stress. <laughs> Generally, those are my few options. Uh, kids are hard, uh, especially with everything going on right now. Like it's just, you know, life is tough. Things are stressful. Um, and so just finding a way to deal with those, either accepting them or decreasing them if possible, sealing those little moments for calmness and peace uh, and resilience um, can be really tough to come by, but crucial to come by. Um, and then seek help, get, find a counselor, get somebody that you really feel like you connect well with, that you can share these thoughts and feelings where they can give you ideas of things that can help you deal with your stress. Um, and so, yeah, so my heart goes out to you. I'm so sorry you're having to deal with this. Uh, but I do think that with some stress reduction, bladder training, um, meditation um, can be really good even if it's just some calm, peaceful walking meditation. Um, um, meditation for skeptics is a great book um, to help with, uh, uh, or for fidgety meditators, I think is the name of the book. Um, so anyway, check that out. I think it could be a good resource, but my heart goes out to you and um, I do think that you can help this. So um, don't give up on working for it. So thanks for joining me for this Q&A. I will be back next week to answer a few more questions and hopefully spur on some additional ideas and thinking to help you uh, solve your issues and move forward.